So this um, talk is kind of about, you know, we, we've been talking about some hard, uh, hard technical issues around the design of systems. Um, I want to step back a little bit and talk about the kind of experience, the human experience of the systems that we interact with. Um, and the, my, my interest in this sort of stuff has arisen kind of in the recognition um, of the role that, that experiences with governance have had for me and that I've seen others have. For instance, um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time focused on democracy stuff. I've spent the last decade of my life working in the cooperative movement, for instance. Before that, it was democratic social movements. And why am I so obsessed with democracy? <laughs> why do I think this can work um, and, and matters, despite all the evidence to the contrary in the world? And I've had to realize that actually a big part of that is that when I was like a teenager, I had some good experiences with democracy at you know, a school I was part of, I, I, I went to where I got involved in some policy change and stuff like that. Um, and, and once I remember being at a, a, a gathering of like, social movement elders. And one thing that really struck me was that the, as they went around the room introducing themselves, um, many of them introduced themselves through a story in their early lives of experiencing like success. And, and a lot of these people I'd known, but I hadn't known those stories. And it helped me like see the whole, th the whole community differently. Oh, wow. You all are here and were able to make a lifetime of social change work because you had experienced something early, because of something you had experienced, because a glimpse of something that you've seen. And so that has made me start to think about the work that a lot of us are doing about the construction of new online spaces in terms of what kinds of experiences are we enabling people to have that will shape the sense of possibilities that they feel and, and bring to everything else that they, that they do. Um, you know, of course, like democracy, like objectively is in all kinds of trouble. So these experiences are particularly urgent. You know, like it goes back to when Alexis de Tocqueville, the French aristocrat, colonialist, imperialist guy, um, came to write about um, American democracy in the 1830s. Uh, you know, one thing he noticed among all the other stuff he overlooked was was the way in which small-scale, intimate experiences of democracy and civic associations was like what made the whole thing work. And so that, too, is really important to recognize, that, that kind of fractal relationship between our everyday experiences and the, the stuff that seems really big and important and, and out of reach. These things are really linked. And certainly, of course, we are in a moment where our planet, <laughs> at least our ability to live on it, depends on, on our ability to, to listen to each other, to work together, to find better ways uh, to coordinate through our social movements, through our uh, uh, political structures, through all sorts of ways in which power flows our economies. And the turn to the online, uh, online governance is a new opportunity to open doors, to create experiences, and to shift um, the, uh, the, the frame of possibilities. Um, the problem is that online uh, uh, governance is rife with dystopias at present. We are um, working upstream if we are hoping to create uh, forms of coordination, of dem democracy, whatever words like, you know, vibe best with you or whatever. Um, we're up against more than I think we often recognize. So a first story, it's one that, that, that has been ground, a historical story that has been grounding my, my research over the last few years, which is this concept of implicit feudalism. This is the idea built into virtually every social space online that any of us have experienced, going all the way back to BBSs, old bulletin, bulletin board services before the internet, through every social network virtually, IRC channels, uh, uh, MySpace, Facebook groups, um, uh, you know, ch uh, chat groups, everything. 
base, everything that has a server involved has some kind of uh, a set of logics that involve you know, uh, absolute control from an administrator, power wielded mainly through the ability to censor and exile, voice um, uh, merely expressive, or what, what I've uh, with, uh, called, called affective voice rather than effective voice, you know, people have the ability to persuade and complain, but not to, for instance, vote out their moderators. Um, and so, so in many respects, we've been training ourselves through, again, experience, not to have certain kinds of power. And I think a lot of like moral panics that you see online, like cancel culture or whatever, actually derive from this. The fact that we don't have good mechanisms for addressing conflict and shifting power is that we turn to really bad mechanisms. We turn to, to mechanisms that you know, are, are, are crude, imprecise, um, prone to overreach. And, um, and, 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 and I worry that those kinds of experiences are feeding our political imagination. You know, they create, they limit the set of possibilities that we think we can have in our, um, in not just our everyday online lives, but our political lives more broadly. You know, crypto and blockchains and this sort of stuff is really important in the context of, of um, implicit feudalism. Because for the first time in important ways um, in online life, we've had the, we have the opportunity to get out of servers. You know, to have networks that are uh, collectively governed by default. That is a really, really important opportunity. But I think the danger that, that uh, enters in uh, when we turn to blockchains is this reliance on, on crypto economics, this reliance on economics as a substitute for politics. I think a lot of really good stuff, and you know, cool things can be done with economic mechanisms and with crypto economics. But if we rely on it exclusively, we, again, lose the sense of political possibility. We lose the sense that we have a system that cares about us, about us as humans, in which we can participate as humans. Instead, you know, our, 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 it reduces us as, you know, to token holders, to wallets, you know, to our, uh, uh, whatever our financial picture looks like. And I think that's a really dangerous thing too. You know, and, and political theorists for many generations have been um, uh, raising alarms about outside of blockchains, political systems that are um, reducible to economics, you know, the specter of neoliberalism. In many respects, you could see uh, uh, crypto as you know, the, the, the kind of purest articulation of precisely the thing they're worried about. Fortunately, um, I think there's a growing recognition of this danger, a growing anxiety about relying on, um, for instance, token-based governance for everything, turning toward things like soul-bound tokens or whatever your preferred implementation is of something that, 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 that treats participants as something closer to humans rather than quantities of tokens. Um, and so I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, uh, movement in the right direction here. But I want to turn back to the question of experiences. What kinds of experiences are we creating? Our Discord servers, in our, in our like weird voting booths, in our wallets. You know, how is this shaping and opening and closing the possibilities of who we can be? Fortunately, we have an opportunity to play. I'm going to introduce some of the things that, um, that I and others have been working on in the context of this uh, group called the Meta Governance Project. Uh, we started out as a kind of small collective of, um, of researchers and practitioners doing stuff around online governance. Now we have a Slack with like over 600 people in it, a weekly seminar, uh, lots of research projects going on. and um, uh, and uh, a few people in this room are part of that group. Raise your hand if you're if you're on the MetaGov Slack. Yeah, Z right there is uh, uh, gets credit for the knowledge 
Commons and Skunk Works language here, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> um, this is a, a collective that would love uh, you all to consider joining us, um, and we're, um, we're playing with this stuff all the time. Our initial paper introduced this concept of modular politics. This is an attempt to imagine a kind of different substrate uh, uh, to the logic of implicit feudalism. What would it look like if we had uh, systems that um, were actually designed for interesting governance experiments and experiences? And, and probably a lot of you in crypto land are going to recognize some of these patterns because um, it's been exciting to see in the years since this paper came out and even before it how a lot of these ideas are already being implemented. The idea of modularity, that, that governance systems should be composed of smaller pieces that you can move around and, and, and interchange in the same way that a lot of our other digital systems are modular, um, allowing us to recombine and recreate and fork and play around with um, the, the component parts. Expressiveness, the sense that we don't all have to adopt a single set of, um, uh, of, of governance logics that the system is able to uh, express a wide variety of governance possibilities, which I think is particularly important in an intercultural context, recognizing that we all come from really different cultural contexts with different kind of cultural um, norms and skills. We should be able to bring those things into our online governance spaces rather than simply accepting the imposition of a kind of implicit feudal or some other form of, um, of, of governance. So the idea is not to say, okay, we're going to replace implicit feudalism with implicit, you know, um, 19th century liberal democracy, right? The idea is to create systems that allow play and experimentation as well as inheritance of long-held traditions. Portability, just like, you know, you can have a, a, a WordPress plugin made for a, a shoe e-commerce store and then insert it into a sticker e-commerce e store, right? You should be able to move things across context. Again, we're seeing a lot of this, this kind of logic in like the Dow factories and other kinds of systems being built in this space. And interoperability. So here we, we're trying to reflect the logic that the aforementioned Eleanor Ostrom described as polycentric governance. The idea that, that much governance in the real world is about not just something within an institution, but actually the interactions among institutions. So let's make sure that our systems are able to talk to each other. And one thing we've been building, get to a bit later too, in, uh, in, in Medigov is, is helping to establish standards for doing that. Okay, and so let's move to the question of, of experience, feel. You know, vibes, isn't that the word? That's the word in this, in this community, right? What are the vibes associated with any of this stuff? Um, this is what I've been really trying to focus on in my, own, um, in my own experiments. So one early example uh, that I've been working on is a, a project called Community Rule. It's an attempt, a really bare bones early attempt to imagine what would it look like to be able to de design governance structures Visually, intuitively, in the same way that someone might make a mock-up for a website, or um, or or or, pick a theme, or you know, just scratch off whatever the whatever thing we do in our online lives. Let's be able to make governance systems really easy. Community rule allows you to do a kind of drag and drop governance assembly process. Um, it exports in various formats, including like GitHub friendly Markdown. Um, it also allows you to publish your, your structures on the site in a library and then fork other people's um, structures. Uh, so the idea here is uh, to create a kind of commons, you know, as well as a, a, a source of authoring so that people can start building on each other's work. And it's been really fun to see some of those examples where people have taken something somebody else did, forked it a little bit, tweaked it, and then they actually see the original author come back and and learn from, uh, from what others built on it. Again, trying to just shape that texture of experience. 
governance should not just be something molded by people who happen to be able to write code. How could we make sure that, uh, you know, one of the design goals for this, um, for me, is to start moving it toward um, enabling the translation of these, uh, these visual experiences into something that can be implemented in code or that can be translated into code. Another experiment has been um, in the context of games. Um, so I, I uh, am really into this uh, game with my kid, Mind Test, which is an open source community built Minecraft clone, a voxel game. And um, it's, it's really moddable. So I, I've been working with a um, small group in Medigov and beyond on developing um, a, frame, a, a mod for this game that allows you to do expressive governance. So you can write kind of like one page plugins, modules, uh, uh, as small governance mechanisms, and you can link them together and form groups inside the game and set rules for those groups and govern them in different ways, have different kinds of decision-making processes. We have a token module, all sorts of things like that. Um, the idea here is to uh, introduce <laughs> diverse forms of self-governance into spaces where people play. A lot of the people who play in this, in, uh, this game are kids. You know, those experiences, I think, are, are really important. You know, one of the most powerful things that, that has ever happened with Community Rule is that um, at D-Web Camp in, in California last, uh, last year, uh, we had a, a session about kids and governance, and some kids were there because there lots of people had their kids. Um, and and a group of um, elementary school kids just took this tool and spent like hours designing their ideal school on it. And they started out being like food fights every day, right? And then like <laughs> an hour later, they were like, actually, if we had food fights every day, it would get old and who would clean up? You know? <laughs> and they ended up developing like very reasonable uh, and a very complex uh, structure for, their, for their, the school of their dreams. Another project um, is, uh, is uh, Governance Archaeology. A paper on this was just published in um, Daedalus, uh, the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and, Sci uh, Arts and Humanities, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, just this last week. Here the idea is to, to turn to those traditions I talked about earlier, to, to catalog and honor the governance traditions uh, from around the world, from throughout history, that we can build on and learn from and develop relationships with. And so governance archaeology includes not only an effort to catalog, but also a practice of, of relationship, of a recognition of ancestry uh, in, order to, um, uh, uh, in order to ensure that we are not repeating forms of colonization that have often been part of, uh, of relationships to the past. And, and so much more. Um, so for instance, one really uh, a vibrant project out of Medigov right now is called Dow Star, um, where we're working with different Dow factory projects to, um, uh, to develop standards so they can support more interoperability, um, more uh, also uh, uh, compliance with the growing interest of, uh, of uh, government regulators, um, but above all, to make sure that the governance happening within DAOs is not contained there. Um, and that through shared standards, we're able to, to craft really intentional polycentric networks of online communities. I want to share a bit finally uh, about some of the, the horizons that I'm really focused on. Uh, the things that, that um, I, I think we still really need to work out and I would love collaborators and partners in thinking through these things. One, again, is that challenge of being both intuitive and computational. How do we make sure we have governance systems uh, uh, and design processes that anybody um, with, with you know, a modicum of, of you know, of, of, uh, that anybody is able to really participate in crafting? So we're not leaving it up to the system engineers. So much of that logic of implicit feudalism is simply just like the laziness of applying you know, the Unix permissions model to groups, right? Applying 
the, the system of the computer to the people. You know, we should be able to have systems in which people can generate their own designs for how they want to be self-governed um, and to translate those then into something a computer can understand rather than that, that flow always going the other way. Conjoined with this is that recognition of, of cultural difference, that rec recognition that, that when we create a system, we may be, we are inevitably working with assumptions that, uh, and blind spots that we're not going to be able to see ourselves. You know, we're coming out of particular cultural traditions, particular things that we've taught, been taught to think are important that may not be important for everybody else. We need to make sure to have systems that are, um, that are expressive enough to reflect the profound cultural and governance diversity of our, um, you know, of our human family. This has been my obsession right now, and actually we're going to have a... Um, we're going to have a session on this, uh, a kind of deep dive at the Medigov House uh, later today at 3 o'clock on attention economies in governance. Now, this is really, really important. You know, I was, for instance, hearing a talk uh, uh, yesterday about get, how Gitcoin governance has evolved uh, in the Gitcoin DAO and how much, like, they've been wrestling with this challenge of, like, how, what do we expect how much attention and knowledge do we expect of the average token holder, right? So this is about how do we design our organizations to uh, expect appropriate things from our participants um, to make sure that, that our expectations of the design are balanced with what people can actually provide in terms of their ability to like vote on a, um, on a, a, a proposal, for instance. You know, I'm, I'm on paper or on Ledger, a, a, a Gitcoin steward. The only vote that I felt I knew enough about to, to participate in was about um, pineapple pizza. Um, and as soon as the real votes came up, I just felt I, I do not have the capacity to understand what's going on here. Um, and so I'm really interested in how can we design systems that, that uh, uh, reflect people's actual capacities to sit in discords 24 hours a day or not, um, and also that, 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 that um, explore the challenge of, of what it means if we win. What would it really mean if like half the passwords, hundreds of passwords in my password manager, right, were actually uh, uh, communities that I had co-ownership and governance rights in? How could I possibly manage that, like, that array of accountability? I think this challenge of, of, of um, creating interfaces and experiences in which people really can be, um, be full participants uh, while at the same time um, you know, managing many, many spaces of, of self-governance you know, is, is, is a really cool frontier uh, uh, for us to explore. And there's, you know, I think, a lot of really interesting starting points starting to develop in the ecosystem here around the dashboards, the... Um, the, the kind of voting platforms that allow us to look at multiple DAOs, multiple spaces all at once. Finally, these experiences need to be stupidly fun. Um, you know, sometimes people in DAO will ask me, like, how do, uh, you know, know a lot about co-ops. Um, uh, I'm so frustrated because only 0.1% of holders are participating in votes. And, you know, I tell them about, we have 40 something rural electric cooperatives here in Colorado, when they have annual meetings, they bring a robot. It helps people come and really good food. You know, this is how you do it. <laughs> you have to make governance part of a community, make it fun, make it part of the, um, the experience. Um, and, and so many of the challenges that, that DAOs and other online governance spaces are facing right now, you know, are not new. There are things that, that, um, that other kinds of spaces of self-governance have been wrestling with for a long time. Uh, we have a lot to learn, and we also have a lot of room to grow. And throughout this, I'm just really trying to keep focused on, um, on who this is for. You know, I, I hope that my kids have experiences of positive self-governance. 
um, in ways that will uh, 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 give them lifelong hope. I don't know where they're going to have those experiences. Is it going to be in games? Is it going to be in school? Is it going to be in, uh, you know, anonymous underground darknet DAOs? I don't know. But I hope they have them, and I hope I can contribute to helping, uh, you know, to helping more, uh, you know, more kids like them um, feel that sense of their own power and their own dignity. Uh, that's all. Thank you so much.